at uh, a new study today in uh, the Book of Romans. I think I mentioned last week. It's been approximately 19 years since I taught this book. Even though it was put on video by Earth, uh, it's still been hanging around. So hopefully we'll be able to update that study and uh, bring some new life and truth to that this great book. You know, I get the uh, privilege, I guess you would say today, I, I entered this study with fear and trepidation because uh, Sean McDowell uh, addressed probably the number two most controversial subject this morning in a very elegant manner. He's a great communicator, and whether you agree with him or not, he's very, very thorough in his communication. And uh, he did a great job with a difficult subject. I get to address uh, the number one most controversial subject in the culture today in Romans chapter 1. If you're familiar with Romans chapter 1, you know what I'm talking about. So that's why I enter this study with fear and trepidation. That is not my only subject. We're going to deal with the entire chapter 1 of Romans. So there's going to be a little bit more variety, but uh, I still get to deal with that uh, delicate, uh, difficult subject. So without any further ado, we're going to jump in here, and I'm going to keep the introduction uh, somewhat short because this book uh, speaks for itself, and it has so many truths in it that uh, hopefully we will not only enjoy, but understand and uh, live some new truths in our lives. And I named this uh, after that great verse in uh, the first chapter, the just shall live by faith. The verse that caused the enlightenment, caused uh, Martin Luther to be enlightened and start the Reformation, one of many that did that. And so that's also the key verse if you've seen in your piece of paper. Let me also say, that uh, I put uh, the just shall live by faith is in four places in the Bible. So I guess you would think it's important. If God said it four times, if he said it once, it's important. But if he said it four times, it's very important. And I listed the other three times, uh, other than Romans 1, 17 in your Bible, in your notes. And uh, there's an emphasis change in each one of those, even though the, the words are the same. And uh, uh, those of you who would like to discover that, one of those, not the Old Testament version, Habakkuk 2.4, it's also in the Old Testament, but the three in the New Testament, one of those emphasizes the just, another one emphasizes shall live, and another one emphasizes by faith. Now, do a little research and riddle it out and see if you can figure out which ones are emphasize which. That's a little task for you if you can uh, do that during the course of the week. Well, uh, the book of Romans has been called a lot of things. Probably one of the things I've heard it called kind of puts his the emphasis on where it should be. It's been called the fifth gospel because the apostle Paul, even though he did not, was not one of the 12 that walked and talked, with Jesus, he actually saw the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus. So we can put him in the same camp as the disciples. And he also spent three years in the desert studying, and I'm sure there were appearances there from our Lord himself. So he, uh, you can put right at the top of the, of the apostle list. The Roman road, which is so much referred to in Romans, is a way to lead someone to Christ. I know that many of you have heard it, know it, some of you may be by heart, but before we finish this study, you're all gonna be card-carrying members of the Roman Road. I'm gonna have it on a little card, which you can put in your wallet or your purse, and I can tell you that one of the reasons that people do not attempt to lead people to Christ is they don't know how. Or that's at least what they say. Now, there's a word to get around that, but you can no longer say that because you've got this card that says, here is the road 
to Christ, the Roman road. And the scripture lays it out very, very carefully. I think Lennox taught a class on the Roman road uh, many, many years ago. But I've said on every page of this book is one of two things, either the way to God or a walk with God. And it addresses both so plainly that uh, you, anyone can understand it. And it shows us when we're out of step with God and how to get back. It's been called by many things, but a couple of things I liked. It's been called the Believer's Constitution. You know, a constitution gets a lot of bad things said about it these days, but it's still the Magna Carta, and it's also the Christian Magna Carta. Romans has been called. So a couple of great names that people have said about Romans. So Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans in about 56 AD, and he wrote it from Corinth, which on his third missionary journey, journey he had never been to Rome, but knew many of the members there, as he mentions toward the end of the book, because many people that left Jerusalem went to Rome, People came in and out of Rome, and so therefore he knew a lot about them in the church. And the church was evidently founded by Jews and proselytes in Jerusalem who were there during the day of Pentecost. Remember the day of Pentecost when all of the proselytes and the Jews from all nations came into Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they evidently, there were a group of Jews and proselytes who went back to Rome and started the church. So that's the way it actually began. But before we get there, I want to read you just a couple of things and I could spend the whole entire time talking about what people have said about Romans. But I want to just give you a couple of three to kind of whet your appetite just a little bit. It was Godet, the Swiss commentator, who said that the reformer, Reformation was certainly the work of the epistle to the Romans. And that it is probably that every great spiritual <coughs> renovation in the church will always be linked both in cause and effect to a deeper knowledge of this book. It was Martin Luther who wrote that the epistle to the Romans is the true masterpiece of the New Testament and the very purest gospel which is well worthy and deserving that a Christian man should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but also that he should daily deal with it as the daily bread of men's souls. It can never be too much or too well read or studied, and the, the more and the more that you do, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Christendom, one of the early church fathers, had the epistle read to him twice a week. And it was Coleridge who said that the epistle to the Romans was the most profound writing that exists. Further, we find that, that one of the great scientists turned to this book and he found that it gave him a real faith. This man, Michael Faraday, was asked on his deathbed by a reporter, what are your speculations now? He said, I have no speculations. My faith is firmly fixed in Christ my Savior who died for me and who has made a way for me to go to heaven. And of course that great person, John Bunyan, who wrote a book called Pil Pilgrim's Progress that has sold more copies than anything other than the Bible, said, and he, by the way, he was no intellectual giant, but <clears throat> this man said this, the life of John Bunyan, who was no intellectual giant, nor was he a poet, but he wrote a book that has been exceeded in sales by only the Bible. This book is Pilgrim's Process, Progress. It is a story of a sinner that was saved by grace, as we all are, and that sinner was John Bunyan, and the record of history is that this man read and studied the Epistle to the Romans and he told its profound story in his own life story, the story of Pilgrim. That he came to the cross and that the burden of sin rolled off and that he began that journey to the celestial city. 
I'm not going to mention any more. There are so many that I could have brought up, but that was just enough to give you a taste of that. But anyway, going back to Acts 2, 5, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and then they began to speak in languages of the people out there so that everybody understood what they were saying in their own language. And Peter then preached a sermon and 3,000 were saved. And some of those were from Rome and went back and started the church. By the way, it is believed there were several churches in Rome, small, one main church, but the letter to the Romans was circulated amongst those churches. Now, Paul, after having traveled 15,000 miles approximately in 15 years on his three missionary journeys, I see some of you are shaking your head. Can you imagine that is all by foot or by boat? Thousand miles a year by foot or by, by boat. And that's not taking into account all the teaching that he did. Establishing churches in Asia Minor, which is the modern day Turkey and Europe. But he had a burning desire to visit Rome. First seven verses of this chapter is the intro, and we'll go through these very quickly. Verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Bondservant is what Paul called himself. Not just a servant, but a bondservant. It's the word for slave in Greek. Now, in the Greek culture, in the Roman culture, <laughs> slaves were nothing. They were just people to do work for them. But a slave to God puts a little bit, bit of a twist on it. I'm happy to be a slave of God if he would have me as a slave because that sets it apart from what a slave is. He said, called to be an apostle. Well, we know that uh, an apostle means one sent, and in this case, one sent to bear the good news of the gospel of Christ. And it is believed by many that Paul was the replacement uh, for Judas, and uh, even though Matthias was the one that they drew the straw on, and we won't know that until we get to heaven, so we can just speculate all we want, but he was certainly an apostle as he says he was. Second, separated to the gospel of God. Now, in Acts chapter 9 is where he got his calling from God. We're on the road to Damascus where he was out to kill and to put in chains and in jail Christians. God struck him down and he called him. And he was blinded by that call, but he accepted the call and he said to Paul, he said, I have called you to be my emissary to the Gentiles and to kings and also to the Jews because he also uh, taught the Jews. Of course, we say that Peter was the apostle to the Jews and Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but actually Peter crossed over and Paul crossed over. That was just their main mission and calling of God. Separated to the gospel of God simply means he was set apart to be an apostle of God. And by the way, he paid his own way, as we know, he was a tent maker. He didn't want to take gifts from the different places he wanted, even though he could have. And can you imagine all the miles he traveled, all the churches he planted, he still paid his own way by being a tent maker. Verse 2, when he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. All the prophets, beginning with Moses to, to Malachi, spoke of the good news of the coming Messiah. Isaiah was the prophet that spoke the most in chapters 52 and 53. But Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses said, there will come a prophet in the future from one of you who will be like me. But then he goes on to describe the fact that it is going to be the coming Messiah. And then if you go back to Malachi, the last prophet to speak about the coming one, Maybe I didn't mark it, so here we go. 
The last chapter in Malachi says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. That has referral to the Messiah of the one who is coming in order to save the world. So all through the Old Testament it talks about, the prophets talked about the coming of Jesus. Verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. One of the Jesus messianic titles was Son of David. Do you remember how the person called out, Son of David, have mercy upon me? Uh, Jesus certainly answered that. And his DNA was the Son of God. But he also had the DNA of David, of the flesh, because he's, he was born of the flesh, because he was the God-man. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Spirit of holiness, what is that? Well, that's none other than the Holy Spirit. He is the author of life. He's the one that was brooding over the masses when the world came into being. He's the one that not only makes new life come to us when we accept Christ. So he's the author of life. And he also raised Jesus from the dead. Now that was the reason, or he says, was the power of the resurrection was according to the spirit of holiness was the reason he was the son of God. Now if someone has another religion that they worship, ask them the question, did your founder of this religion ever come back from the dead? Mohammed didn't come back from the dead. Charles did not come back from the dead. I can tell you that uh, there is no one of those leaders, Buddha, Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, rose from the dead. So these may be founders of religions, but the only one ever came back from the dead of those are Jesus Christ. Going on in verse five, through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom you also are the called of Christ to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that completes the first part of the intro to the book. <clears throat> you know, we are all called by grace through faith for obedience to the faith. We are not just called to escape hell. Some of the reasons some people come to Christ is they don't want to go to hell. Well, that's a good reason, and I commend them for that. But we're not just called to escape hell. But we're also called to walk in obedience to God. One of my favorite hymns is Trust and Obey. It says it all. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. If you think about the words of those songs, there's no other way to be happy. And it's not just trust, but it's also obey. And that's the way to be happy in Jesus. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little bit hoarse this morning. Call to be saints. What is a saint? Well, some of you may say, well, that's the people that the Catholic Church decides to anoint as a, into sainthood. Well, I'm not going to condemn them from that because they've obviously picked out a lot of people that are worthy. But all of us, every one of you are called to be saints when you come into the family of God. So what does saint mean? It means to be set apart or it means to be holy. Now, if you run around and tell people that you are holy, <coughs> Uh, they would probably look at you like, uh, yeah, I've seen your act. <laughs> I know that you're not. But the fact is, we are holy if you're in Christ. Because Christ is holy. And if we're in Him, it doesn't matter what we are outside of that. We are holy. And obviously, the grace and peace that Paul uses for his greetings to almost all of his letters, grace was the greeting of the Romans or the Gentiles. 
And peace was the greeting of the Jews, shalom. So he uses these because he's addressing both Jew and Gentile. Verse 8, he says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Now, Paul was a Southern Baptist, you know, because he said you all. <laughs> At least my mother thought he was. <laughs> All that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now that's quite a reputation, isn't it? Your, your faith has been spoken of throughout the whole world. Now he's talking about the Roman world or the Roman Empire. And we know that we're saved even today. All roads lead to Rome. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Rome, but quite a few of you, I'm sure, you'll know that those rocky stone uh, cement roads that they built, uh, a lot of them are still there. And even though they're crumbled up a little bit, all roads did lead to Rome. So as people came in and out of the Roman Empire, they would uh, go and visit different of these religions. By the way, there was about a million people in Rome in Paul's day, and there were about a uh, hundred different religions. Because Rome, just welcomed all religions. They were, they were not against the law to worship any way you wanted. And as they would go and visit all these different religions, they'd visit the church, and they would find out that these people were real believers in Jesus Christ. And when they would leave, they would tell other people. So it went throughout the entire Roman Empire. Now, the... Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> Again, the first century Christians were not persecuted at all until Nero came along. And Nero was the adopted son of Claudius before him. By the way, there were a lot of uh, emperors that were adopted sons in that day because that was kind of, you went, went and found the person with the most potential and it may not have been your own flesh. So they would find them, they would adopt them, and become the next emperor. But he was the adopted son of Claudius. He came to the throne, and everything went great for the first couple of three years. He did a lot to win over the people, and then he decided he needed to do something to create Rome in his own image. So what did he do? He burned the city, or at least he set fire to the city. It didn't completely burn down, but it burned for about six days before it was put out. And he also blamed the Christians because you got to blame somebody, otherwise they're going to say you're responsible. So he blamed the Christians, and the Christians for several years forward were persecuted because of that fire, because of what Nero had done. By the way, this was the time that Paul wrote this letter to the Romans was during the reign of Nero. And some of the things he talks about and says in Romans, you'd be amazed, like obey the government. Well, Nero was on the throne, and he was a madman. So, uh, but uh, he meant exactly what he said. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Paul was a very humble man, and he was saying, maybe I can help you, maybe you can help me. If the believers in Rome needed anything, it was encouragement. Again, a letter from someone of Paul's stature would help these approximately one million people in the city that had all these different religions, and they were just a tiny little place that had the faith in Jesus Christ, and they needed encouragement. They felt small and alone, and I've always said Satan's number one tool is discouragement. If Satan can discourage you, you can do little to nothing. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do. You get discouraged even in reading the Bible. What do you do? You stop. You get discouraged in your work. What do you do? You don't do very good work. If you can get discouraged in anything, your faith, 
your faith starts to fall. So Paul here chooses four ways to lift their spirits, and that's always a good thing. First of all, he affirmed them in verse 8. He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you. Isn't that a good thing to say to someone? I thank God for you because what you meant to me and what you meant in my life. So he affirmed them first. Secondly, Paul prayed for them in verse 9. I can tell you that if there were no other reason, I would attend this class just for the prayers because the people here pray and things happen. People here pray and you know someone's praying for you. This is a praying, praying group. Not just a Bible study group. It is a people of prayer. Number three, Paul expressed his desire to be with them. You know, it's a wonderful thing to pray for people. But when you tell them, I'm going to come over and visit you, when you know they may be alone, when you know they may be discouraged, I'm going to come over and visit you. Is that okay? You know what they'll say? I would love that because they know that you mean business and you're not just praying for them. You want to actually see them. Number four, Paul promised to assist them. In verse 11, he says to empower them with some gift. What he's referring to here, I believe, is some supernatural gift and like knowledge and wisdom, which he certainly had. Maybe I can show you some things in the Bible you do not understand. Maybe I have a special word of God from you, which was a gift in that day, to be able to do that. So he helped them be established in the faith. Verse 13, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. Who hindered it? Well, God said, no, I got this for you to do, that for you to do. Guess what? God wanted to go to Rome last. And that would be the last place that he went. That I might have some fruit among you, also just as among the other Gentiles. He said, I'm a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. <clears throat> what is the fruit he's talking about here? He's talking about more converts. Paul had fruit all over the Roman Empire because of all of the places he had been, but more Christians growing in the faith. You know, there's nothing more exciting than being part of a growing church. You ever go to a dead church? I have. You generally know it when you walk in the front door. I used to go all over the country trying to find companies to buy because when we were going national. And I can tell you that when I stood at the reception desk to tell them I were there and to call whoever the owner of the business was, I had an appointment to visit with them. And as I walked about that office, sometimes I wanted to walk back out the door and not even visit with the owner. It was dead as a doornail. There was no excitement there. And sometimes I did because it's exciting. And when you go into a place, a church or a business or anything else, and it's upbeat, it's exciting, you want to be there. You want to be part of that. So it's pretty important to be an exciting, growing church. And there's, by the way, two ways to grow in a church. One is spiritually and the other is in numbers. The most important part is spiritually. You can be a country club and grow in numbers. You can be a comedy club and grow in numbers. People go to hear people make jokes or laugh or whatever else. But if it's not growing spiritually, it's not growing at all. So the people need to be fed. They need to be growing spiritually. And out of that, you will grow in numbers. Our number one advocate of that is Bob <laughs> Vanderzag, who continues to pray for this church to be spirit-filled, and we appreciate those prayers. Don't stop. Amen. Praise God. Then he mentions one thing here that I, that I need to mention. He, 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 he says, I'm indebted to barbarians. Now, you need to understand the word in that day it didn't mean crude people that, uh, you know, had claws for fingers and everything else. A barbarian was a person who was not schooled in the ways of Rome. Not a Roman citizen, not schooled in the ways of Rome. They were a barbarian. So once they became a citizen or in the ways of Rome, they were no longer a barbarian. Verse 15, so as much as in me, 
He said, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I, this is one of the key verses, even though I didn't list it, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. How many of you have memorized that verse? We did uh, in a group that we were in early on. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 17. Got it? Verse 17. Are we ashamed of the gospel? I would say it was sounding no. We're not ashamed of the gospel. We live the gospel. We were saved by the gospel. It's the good news. So why don't we speak up more about the gospel? Well, some people will say, you know, I don't have the opportunity. You pray about it and you will. Simple as that. Somebody will show up and ask you about Christ. Just pray about it. Lord, I'd like to give the gospel out to somebody. So uh, the next person says, well, I don't know how. Well, if you don't know how and you haven't have your card yet, <laughs> tell them what God did for you. That's all you need to do. Give them your testimony. Someone can come to know the Lord with one verse, John 3, 16. Now, we're going to get you a little more in depth before we get out of this book. But John 3, 16, I bet everyone in this room can quote that verse. By the way, there are a lot of lost sinners that can quote that verse. They know that verse, but they don't know the meaning of that verse. So, do we really know? Now, the reason to speak up here, he gives a couple of reasons. One, he says, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There's only way people get saved is by the power of God and by faith in God. Number two, he says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. We learn the righteousness of God by studying His Word. We learn the righteousness of God by walking in His Word. And he says the righteousness, or the righteous, or the just, will live by faith. I mentioned to you, and you have in your notes, four times it's repeated in the Bible. It has caused more people to turn or to be enlightened by Christ than any other verse in the Bible. Certainly, Martin Luther is the first example of that. Now I'm coming to one of the more controversial or challenging passages in the Bible. And it lasts from verse 18 of chapter 1 all the way to chapter 3, verse 20. So it's quite a range. I wanted to make sure I had enough time to deal with this today. So I left a few things out so I could get to this bottom section of uh, finish up chapter 1 of Rome, Romans, and not have to get to any other subjects, but we will deal with that in the next few months to come. <coughs> the wrath of God. The wrath of God is comes from the love of God. I, it's the best way to say it. God is love. And the reason His wrath is turned on evil and sinfulness is because He is love. It's totally against His nature. Completely reversed to His nature. So I want to start with that because this is a long section on the wrath of God. Let me ask you, if you were going to make up your own God, what would He be like? Well, there are people today that say he would be a woman. Someone told me that fairly recently. Nothing against women, but that's kind of the way they believe. Now, I took three answers to this question because it's been asked from time to time. And just as an example, I'm not saying this is anybody here, but here's what one said. He would be like Santa Claus, a jolly fellow who brings me gifts. Secondly, a person said, 
he would be a witty person who keeps me laughing. Another one said, he would be a serene butler type who keeps me out of trouble. Another one said, he would be a designer God who makes me look good. You know, in the days of the Roman Empire, <clears throat> these gods that I just mentioned could have been idols because they worshiped idols. These little ones they could carry around. In fact, <clears throat> my, one of my favorite movies, Gladiator, even though it's a rough, crude movie, I still love that movie. You remember Russell Crowe when he took his little idols out and he prayed to each one of them? I don't know what the idols were of, but uh, he prayed to those idols. These could have been gods they carried around. And we must study the entire Bible to know and understand the God who is there. That was a title of a book by Francis Schaeffer many years ago. But it's the God who is there, not the God we imagine that he should be. Now this next section we're going to get to, <clears throat> some today ignore, some will skip over it, because it's not the God that they desire or it's not the God that they want him to be. And in verses 18 through 23, we discover a God who is angry. Why is he angry? Because of sin. And the grossest, complete time, type of sin that you can imagine. But remember, 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. It doesn't just say God loves us. He is love. He's love through period, his entire being. So that's what this stems from and nothing else. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them which is why he will not stand idly by while, he, while evil and sin consumes his creation. He burns against ungodliness and unrighteousness. God's rules for living were set down in the Ten Commandments. By the way, cultures who did not even know God had something like the Ten Commandments because these commandments were things that governments and people could live by, rule by, and grow, grow and flourish. They discovered that. But the Ten Commandments, by the way, they were not written to spoil our fun, as some people thought. They were written because this is the way to be happy, like trust and obey. This is the way to be happy. Obey these, and you can be happy in this life. You know, we express contempt for God's character when we call things bad, things good, bad, and call things bad, good. That's the mark of our generation today. They look at things and they say, well, the Bible says it's this, but good, but this is good. And they reverse those things. And that's what God calls suppressing the truth. Going on in verse 20, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that we are all without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Let me stop there and say, there is a chapter in the Bible <clears throat> that speak to this like no other chapter in the Bible, and it was read this morning by Micah Guy. Some of you may not have been in the first service, <clears throat> so I'm going to read just the first four verses of this chapter, because it speaks exactly what Romans is talking about. And some of you know this by heart. The heavens declare the glory of God, 
and the firmament shows his handiwork. When you look at all of creation and all the things out there, how can you not know that there is a God? Day unto day utters speech. In other words, the sun rises, it's speaking to us. The sun sets, it's speaking to us of the power of a living God. And night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Doesn't matter what language you're speaking in, what race you're speaking to. The universe that God created, his creation, speaks to us day and night. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their worlds to the end of the world. Creation speaks to us about the creation of God. And therefore, he says, we are without excuse. Nature itself is the best argument for intelligent design. How could it happen by accident? Over and over again, the repetitive nature of God. The sun rises, the sun sets, all of these things happen every day. Verse 22, 23, I think I read 22 once, but I'll read it again. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. There are four words for fool in the Bible. The one Paul chose is moros. What do we get our English word from that? Moron. Moron. Mm -hmm. Pretty logical. You know what moron means? Stupid. <laughs> it's pretty hard not to be able to decipher that. He picked that word to say that there are a bunch of morons. Now take note of the downward spiral that starts in verse 23. It says, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Willful ignorance of God, in verse 21, led to imitation of God, verse 21, 22, and ended with a replacement of God. That's the spiral down. Verse 24 and 25 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. The creature is worshipped rather than the Creator. I want to give you example number one. The time's passed, and we'll move to the present. The Egyptians had the Nile River. They still do. There's some controversy today over the Nile River because it is life for the Egyptians because it overflows and the crops are watered and they're able to grow crops and keeps them alive. Well, the Ethiopians decided to build a dam and now there's part of Egypt that is being hurt by this and there could be a war that breaks out or something because of this. But the Nile Delta is their livelihood. Well, guess what? Instead of thanking God, they worshiped the sun and the river. They became gods. The river who gave life, the sun who gave life, they became their gods, not the one who created those. The Greeks and the Romans had their gods in the universe, Zeus and Jupiter, who was the king of gods, and Neptune, who was the god of the sea, and there was the god of storms, and all these different things. They worshiped those things instead of the god who made them. They also worshiped their pharaohs and their emperors. They worshiped a man and substituted him for God. You know, people today <clears throat> look at amusement and are frequently confuse the gift with the giver. They worship things, jobs, hobbies, and forget that it's not bread that keeps him alive, but the God who made it and gave it to him. 
that's why every time I pray before I eat, I say, thank you for the Lord, Lord God for this food because you made it. Mm -hmm. I just add that on because you made it. And that's the only reason I have it. You may say, what thing are you talking about? <clears throat> most, the, whatever you think about most is what you worship. Any for your thoughts? <laughs> Don't tell me. <laughs> you may think this is such a boring guy standing up there. I don't want to hear it anymore, so I don't want to hear it. But what you think about the most is what you worship. Think about that for a minute. Jesus. God is not a passive parent and will hold us accountable for sin, whether we acknowledge his presence or not. It doesn't matter. Now, <clears throat> this next section should have a warning sign. I'm going to read this entire section and make a few comments. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For the reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust for one another Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-minded, this, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving death. Not only do they do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Note that last sentence. There are 21 sins he lists here, and they're all awful. That's why the reason some people would like to leave these out. A reminder first that this is New Testament teaching. This is not Old Testament teaching. This is New Testament. Paul is writing. The same can be found in the Old Testament, obviously. And there are 21 sins here listed and that's the longest list that's in the Bible. There's several other lists that are there. And it begins with sexual sins. I think there's a reason for that. And I think there are two reasons for that. And I'll get to them in a minute. And lays out them specifically. And the reason I think that Paul chose in the first chapter of Romans to deal with these sexual sins is because they were rampant in Rome. Rampant. In fact, homosexuality was not only approved, in some cases it was mandated for an experience they should have by both the Greeks and the Romans. It's not just the Romans. So why do you address it first here out of the chute? Because this was the sin he wanted to get out and he wanted the church to be separated from the world and what was going on around them. But it's no different than today. By the way, the term homosexuality and gay did not come into use until the mid to late 20th century. They didn't use that term back in that day. They were just things that they did because that was what everybody did. Everybody does it, so we do it. It came along later. The term gay was added later and was meant to mean a happy or carefree person. They wanted to put a nice spin on it. You know, many today would like to avoid or skip over verses 
26 and 28. But they're there. It's something a loving God wouldn't say. Or that it doesn't understand my feelings or my body. Which is different. Or in a culture today which has changed. God doesn't understand that. Our culture has changed. And no one wants to be tagged with the sins listed in verses 29 through 31. They're awful. So what has changed? Well, our government has changed. By the way, around the world, not just here. And they made it legal, so it's out in the open, but legal doesn't make it lawful according to the Word of God. But people, because it's legal, they say it's okay. Is it okay with God? Public opinion changed after first our government came out approving <coughs> same-sex marriage and in favor of gay marriage, and the Supreme Court made it the law of the land. Public opinion flipped massively. Let me give you a couple of examples. Today, 64%, it's probably higher than that because it goes up all the time, this goes back probably a year or two. 64% approve of gay marriage today versus 35% in the early mid 2000s. It's double. If it's legal, it's okay. <clears throat> Evangelical Christians who know the Bible and read the Bible, 35% approve. Now, <clears throat> What I'm going to say now is very delicate. We all have friends. We have neighbors. We have family. Sometimes sons and daughters. Or even others similar. That are gay or homosexual. And that hits right into heart. We all have people we know that seem like very good people that are homosexual or gay. And that tugs in our hearts. So how are we to treat people like that that we know that are? I'll say, first of all, with compassion, respect, and prayer. The scripture does not say God gave them up. It says God gave them over even though it says up in one verse and over in the next, the actual root of the word means God gave them over. He didn't give them up. God doesn't give up on anybody. So some would come to their senses when they got to the end of their rope and realized that they were wrong. Mm -hmm. He let them go the way they wanted to go so they would come to their senses. All sexual sins are, are sin, not just this and not to be trifled with. Let me close with this, because we're out of time. I'll be quick. Two good friends of ours and our family, Dr. Barry Corey, the president of Biola, and Jim Daly, who is the president of Focus on the Family, they got together and talked about this issue. They both have to deal with it. You know, Biola is a Christian school, and you have to sign that you're a Christian and order to go there, and yet they know that they have this problem on campus. And Jim Daly focused on the family. What bigger issue would there be? And they came up with this together that they said, we're to have a firm center on this issue with soft edges. In other words, we're not to turn people off. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. That's the firm center, but soft edges. Being able to deal with this issue in a loving and caring manner. You know, Jesus ate and drank with sinners, tax collectors, crooks, prostitutes, and all kinds and types of people. Why? Because he wanted to bring them into the kingdom. Mm -hmm.
and so should we. Mm -hmm. Next week we'll go to chapter two and we're gonna answer the question, hopefully, what is the destiny of those who have never heard the gospel? I think that's answered in chapter two. The question that many, many people have today. God bless you.